I've been involved in over the past week and beyond. Uh, so with that, I just want to turn things over to Chief Medina, and he'll say a few words about the investigation. Thank you, Gilbert, and thank you, everybody, for being here today. Uh, this has been a tough week for our community, uh, but we pitched in and we all worked together uh, to solve this crime. Uh, this crime uh, felt made our community feel like it was under attack. We came together like we always do in the one Albuquerque spirit, and uh, we partnered with everybody to get results quickly. We arrested 51-year-old Mohammed Saeed and charged him for the murder of two Muslim men in our community, Aftab Hussein and Mohammed Faisal Hussein. Uh, we are working with the district attorney's office on potential charges for the murder of two other Muslim men, Niam Hussein and Mohammed Zaire Ahmadi. Uh, you gotta forgive me if I butchered those a little bit. Deputy Commander uh, Kyle Hartsock will share some of the details in a minute and talk about the incredible work law enforcement uh, did to get us to this point. I want to highlight four key points that helped us uh, get to this point of making an arrest today and hopefully bringing a sense of safety back to our Muslim community in Albuquerque. First of all, it was the outstanding partnerships and everybody working together that shows how we could accomplish anything we need to. Uh, I want to thank the U.S. Attorney's Office for being there answering the phone early Saturday morning and ensuring that we got things going in the right direction. Our congressional delegation, I want to thank each and every one of you for ensuring that Washington got us the resources we needed and that all our federal partners were given everything that they needed to have in order for us to be successful and bring this case to a conclusion. I want to thank the President of the United States all the way down through our senators and congresswomen for making sure that we had everything we need. I want to thank uh, our best partner, uh, from time to time, uh, we have to come up and do operations together, and every time the New Mexico State Police is there, and it's just an example of when the Albuquerque Police Department partners with the New Mexico State Police, that we get results. Governor, thank you for your guys' support continuously throughout the years. The FBI, thank you for providing us a place to have a command center for getting us all the resources and information that we needed. ATF was an invaluable partner. Uh, the fact that they were able to turn evidence around quickly for us. Uh, they staffed offices across the nation. They made sure that their resources were available uh, to get us the results we needed. And I've never seen such uh, evidence process so quickly to get us results back. Thank you, Mayor Keller, is the second point for the confidence in the Albuquerque Police Department. His support for the past five years in building up this technology, this department with the technology needed for us to be uh, able to get results like we've gotten in the past few days, the better salaries and improving uh, our situation at the Albuquerque Police Department. Uh, we're treated like professionals and our officers are out every day treating the community as their profession. They are part of the community and we listen to the community. The hard work of our detectives. To, to my right here, I have some key people. I'm going to start with Deputy Chief Barker. Uh, Saturday morning, as usual, as soon as I called, she answered the phone and we started working on getting all the resources together to make sure that we started taking this moving as quickly as we could. Commander George Vega uh, has made a huge change in our investigative uh, bureau. Uh, the changes that our homicide unit has conducted over the past 18 months are unbelievable. Uh, I knew that they would get answers for us and they would resolve this case as they continually work to clear 90% of our homicides uh, in the city. Uh, Commander Nick Sanders immediately made sure that all resources from our crime lab were there and brought people in on weekends. Uh, Deputy Chief Griego over here to our left made sure that our real-time crime center got all our analysts in over the weekend and we did everything we had to. And uh, Lieutenant Del Greco, Lieutenant Juan Cabrera somewhere out there, and Deputy Commander Kyle Hartsock uh, worked endless hours to make sure that we were able to get all the information and that we were able to formulate a plan to move forward. Above all, the detectives of the Albuquerque Police Department who stepped up and worked endless hours and made sure that even though they didn't have much sleep, that they were doing everything they can to help bring resolution to this crime. Most important, I want to thank the people of Albuquerque. On Sunday, when we made the decision to release the information on the suspect vehicle, first of all, our detectives had uh, the faith and the confidence in leadership and they knew that releasing this car meant that they no longer got to look for it in an undercover capacity. But we knew Albuquerque would step up and somebody would find and identify that vehicle for us, which is exactly what happened. And it is the 
the city of Albuquerque, its residents, and in particular the members of the Muslim community who stepped forward, had faith in the department, trusted us, and gave us the information needed so that we could follow through and make the arrest that we made yesterday. To the Muslim community, a big thank you. Uh, over the past year, I've made an point to ensure that we built a ambassador program that focused on ensuring that all members of the community had an ear that would hear their voice uh, within the Albuquerque Police Department. You put faith in us, you trusted us, you passed information on to us that was crucial, and that led for us to being able to make uh, an arrest in this case. And the last thing I'm going to close with is there is still a lot of work that needs to be done. There's still a lot of evidence that needs to be verified, and I think that it's important that we continue to move in that direction so that we could build a solid case for our district attorney's office and the U.S. attorney's office to continue to move this case forward so that we have successful prosecution. We're a portion of the way there, but this case is not resolved until we have a successful prosecution and people are held accountable. And above all, the last thing is this. The Albuquerque Police Department will continue to be visible in the Muslim community in the days to come and throughout the weeks to ensure that they feel safe and that they have time to come back to a normal life and ensure that they feel safety. So our officers from the Albuquerque Police Department, New Mexico State Police will continue to be visible within the community uh, and to make sure that everybody feels safe. Thank you. Uh, with that, we're going to have Deputy Commander Kyle Hartsock uh, give a little more detail uh, on the investigation itself. Good afternoon. My name is Deputy Commander Kyle Hartsock. Uh, I'm in the Criminal Investigations Division of the Albuquerque Police Department. Back on July 26 of 22, uh, late at night, uh, Atfab Hussein was found shot to death off Rhode Island Southeast. On August 1st, 22, again late at night, Mohammed Afzil Hussein was found dead not too far away off Cornell Southeast. Our homicide unit as well as the crime scene team started to notice some similarities between these two cases. With the help of the ATF's NIBIN program, we were able to relate the casings found on both these scenes that were likely fired from the same firearm. We quickly started looking at other cases that could be similar and identified that there might be a really active public threat, someone targeting a certain community <clears throat> for reasons unknown or certain persons for reasons unknown. Five days ago, we came to the public and asked you guys for help just five days ago, and in five days we've identified 51-year-old Mohammed Saeed as the person who perpetrated at least the two crimes on Rhode Island and Cornell Southeast. We're continuing to investigate his involvement in the other crimes closely with the district attorney's office and the federal prosecutor's office. What we can tell you is a tip from the community is what helped <clears throat> us lead us to this subject and what helped us eventually find the car that we put out just two days ago to the public. Hundreds of tips have come in, at the very least, that have been thoroughly reviewed and gone through. Dozens of interviews took place. We started to focus in on Mr. Saeed, uh, and last night secured a search warrant for his residence near Gibson and Carlisle in southeast Albuquerque. As we were getting ready to execute that search warrant, we saw him load into a vehicle. As a matter of fact, the vehicle we believed that was used in the homicides that we put out on the poster, and we followed him. Uh, with the help of state police, we were able to stop that car near Santa Rosa, New Mexico, and at the same time, our SWAT team executed a search warrant safely on the occupied home, taking all the residents out and allowing our crime scene and homicide investigators to go into that home. Multiple firearms were recovered from that home that are continually being tested, but right now we believe that at least one of them inside the home and one of them inside the car that was pulled over are matching to our two crime scenes on Rhode Island and Cornell. And that is the basis of the charges that are going forward uh, today with the district attorney's office. Again, we think there might be involvement in two other homicide cases. Those are still considered open and active, but we're working on more evidence testing and more interviews to continue to build that case with the prosecutor's office. <clears throat> Thank you, Kyle. Um, now, as the Chief said, we have had a, a lot of help from the State of New Mexico State Police and from the Governor's Office. So with that, I want to introduce Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham. Um, I stand uh, with everyone here today um, feeling 
positive about the work of law enforcement officers, about what happens when we are really clear about public safety uh, and focusing on communities, uh, particularly in this particular situation that we know were and can be at risk. And this is the kind of work, this collaboration, that yields real results. Uh, this is law enforcement and all partners at their best. It is what the state uh, and this community both deserve and should expect uh, in any context. Uh, but also it's a place to really thank the public. Uh, without those tips, without that information, uh, we would not be in a situation where we're making this announcement and we can provide to the general public a sense of how we are continuing to protect you, so I want to do that. Two, that we are working on the justice side of that equation, which is uh, absolutely critical, not only for protecting the, the families who have been affected, but also making it really clear that we will bring justice, the full force of the law and accountability will be made. But also, it's a place for us to say that this work, as you heard in the investigation updates, is not done. We're going to continue to need public cooperation. This partnership stays in this context with this incredible focus. And all of the state resources, married with every single local resource, will continue until every single member of every single community, but to particularly the Muslim community, are clear about their safety, wherever they are in this community, wherever they are statewide. And that that sense of community and public safety, that focus, is the focus that we will bring to bear on all issues around the state. And so again, while this is important news about where we are, and I hope for families and many others who are suffering today based on this horrific, or these horrific murders, that there is clarity of purpose and effective leadership between the law enforcement teams who have done everything in their power and will continue to do that to make sure that we improve and create the kind of public safety environment, no matter the threat, that every single person and family in Albuquerque and every single person and family in New Mexico deserves. Uh, thank you again uh, to everyone who is here and to the incredible commitments of our first responders, our investigators, and our law enforcement community. Thank you, Governor. Um, and now we have uh, Congresswoman Melanie Stansberry, who also has been very helpful and supportive along with the entire congressional delegation. Few words. I'm Congresswoman Melanie Stansbury, and I'm proud to represent the 1st Congressional District, which is right here in the heart of Albuquerque. As we know, over the last few days, our community has been rocked to its core by the loss of members from our Muslim community. Our community is still grieving the lives of Muhammad Afsal Hussein, Aftab Hussein, Naeem Hussein, and Muhammad Ahmadi. We have to hold space for this grief as we honor the lives and memories of those who we've lost. These losses are felt deeply in our community and especially for me as one of these individuals slain last week, Mohammed Afsel Hussein, my dear friend and former staffer whose family is with us here today. Mohammed was kind, hopeful, optimistic, a city planner who believed in democracy and in social change and who believed that we could, in fact, build a brighter future for our communities and for our world. Our community has lost brothers, fathers, husbands, uncles, and beloved friends. I want to reiterate the thanks that have been given here today for our incredible law enforcement community, the rapid, diligent, and coordinated response of the Albuquerque Police Department, state police, the FBI, ATF, U.S. Marshals, and other federal law enforcement, our district attorney, U.S. attorney, mayor, governor, and local leaders, along with my fellow colleagues in Congress. Thank you for your leadership. 
This coordinated response and support from the community, as has been said, has been crucial in the rapid response to this emergency and the effective apprehension of the suspect today. Though the work of law enforcement is what has gotten us here today and the primary suspect in these horrific killings has been apprehended, the investigation is ongoing. We would be remiss if we did not address the national profile that these tragedies have garnered across the United States and the terror that has not only gripped New Mexico's Muslim community, but our Muslim communities across the U.S. Our communities have been bracing to respond to the potential of hate-driven crimes and the impacts of Islamophobia and other racist acts that have impacted our communities for far too long. We must continue to engage in that work, to engage in healing, and to recognize the open lines of communication between our communities and law enforcement is what helped to put an end to these specific tragedies. I want to again thank APD, our mayor, our governor, and all of the law enforcement and justice uh, individuals who've been involved in this case for your tireless work over the last several days. We must continue to hold space and grief for our communities as we find a way to move forward together and heal. We must commit again to protecting one another, keeping each other safe, forging bonds of friendship and solidarity. I know that that is what my friend, Muhammad Afsal, would have wanted. And it is in his memory that we will do this work together. Thank you. Um, Chief Medina talked about uh, Mayor Keller's uh, support for APD and for law enforcement, and that played a big part in this. But the mayor, as head of the city, I think brought a whole lot more in terms of city resources and focus on the community and the Muslim community. So with that, I want to introduce Mayor Tim Keller. Thanks. <clears throat> you know, we said over this weekend that this was not reflective of the city of Albuquerque and that we will not let this get in the way of our long-standing commitment to inclusion and to diversity and to justice. It was just two days ago where we also said that we are not going to stop until we can return safety to the Muslim community and that we will be unified in supporting both the community during these tough times but also in supporting law enforcement to bring justice. <clears throat> And now it is with tremendous gratitude that we share this news about a united effort to bring some justice to this situation. What law enforcement has done is what we fundamentally and unfortunately call them to do at times, to work together with urgency, following the proper protocols to get dangerous murderers off the street. That is what these people did. And for that, the city of Albuquerque is grateful. I know that between the FBI and the DA and the state police and our governor and Congress and all those who've been thanked, we always have said that we would be there for each other when we needed it. I remember when our DA and I, we were kind of got these jobs around the same time and same with the governor and even our congresswoman. And, and we each, one of the first conversations we had with each other is that we are going to make sure that roles and jurisdictions do not interfere with what we have to do with our city. And unfortunately, because of the tragedy, uh, but fortunately, we have demonstrated this once again. Truly, what we experienced on the law enforcement and the support front is the one Albuquerque spirit, spreading from our city to our state and our federal partners across the country. For our department, this is a very salient example. 2022 has been tough. We know this. It's been very tough for violent crime in our city. <clears throat> But we also know that under Chief Medina's strong leadership, we are demonstrating a vastly improved department, especially in its investigation capabilities. We've done this in a couple of ways. First and foremost, it is the training and effort and hard work of the individuals and the detectives on the front line who made this happen. I know a lot of us were out till 1 or 2 a.m. Uh, dealing with what was happening. And it is abundantly clear, the professionalism and the ability of everyone who was a part of this. It's also clear that the investments we've made in technology, this would not have been possible without the FBI's technology, but also without the technology that, frankly, the, the governor <laughs> and our congresswoman have helped pay for and city council. 
uh, we are in a vastly different place, and that's what allowed us to move fast, and that speed was absolutely critical in this situation. Also, the investigative training that we do at the Academy, you know, we did not used to have that. We train investigators, and now we are seeing the result when it comes to uh, the number of individuals we've been able to bring in custody who commit violent crime. So we are sending a message. We will catch violent criminals in this city. That has been true throughout 2022. And we are doing our part to bring justice back to our streets. Now, I also want to express gratitude to the Muslim community. I know uh, all of us are doing that, but it's for a very, very good reason. They never gave up on our police department, and they never gave up on the city where they live. And I want to thank you for doing that. There is no way we could have put these pieces together without them. Also, for the public, the residents of Albuquerque, as you heard, we could not have done this without all the tips that came through. And, you know, Sometimes it takes a village, I think Ahmad said, and this is a good example of we're, we did not yet let our fears or even our biases get in the way of doing what we all needed to do to bring some justice. So I want to close by just saying that tonight it's our hope that while families continue to grieve, what our Congresswoman mentioned is absolutely a pain and a scar that is wide open in our community. And while families continue to grieve and our community mourns, the loss of loved ones. Hopefully there is some semblance of safety and some of closure that we know is true because these perpetrators are now in custody and are being charged. And tomorrow, we're going to continue our efforts to support public safety, even in our Muslim community, as, as was mentioned, and also the trauma support that we're providing for our community safety department. And we're going to continue to expand and extend our hearts in openness for those who are in a time of need. And going forward, we are going to build on the progress we've made with our Office of Equity and Inclusion, which played a key role in community support. Also, our Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs. Uh, these are extremely important offices, and we never acknowledge that until there's a tragedy in one of these communities. And it also means we have to formalize what we're doing with our Asian community and with our Muslim community going forward and make sure that these bonds that have been recently forged are there going forward. So with that, let me again say thank you to all those involved uh, who made this happen. And our prayers are still absolutely with the community this evening. Thank you. Uh, now to bring in some of our law enforcement partners, I want to introduce U.S. Attorney Alex Ubias. Good afternoon. My name is Alex Ubias. I'm the United States Attorney for the District of New Mexico. My heart goes out to the families and the communities of these victims, the entire Muslim, Middle Eastern, South Asian community, and to all our communities. Your pain is our pain. Your community is our community. Thank you for your faith and your trust, and we will not let you down. I want to thank, as many of you have here before, all the members of the law enforcement team, the government, the work, and the people in the community who've spent far too many hours over the past four days on the streets and in cars and huddled in rooms and listening to radios and looking at computers and passing through video. These brave folk wearing the badge and these brave folk in the community calling in are working tirelessly on this investigation that continues. And my office and the Department of Justice will spare no resource in support of this effort. We work better when we work together. And together as a community, we will bring those responsible to justice. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, next, we have the FBI Special Agent in Charge, Raul Buhanda. Good afternoon. So I think a lot of the people that are standing up here are tired, but for a good reason because we were driven to do the right thing. This investigation since the beginning has focused on bringing justice to the relatives of four homicide victims, our brothers, while protecting Albuquerque's Muslim community from other harm. The FBI will always be there with you. 
since the FBI set up a command post that is literally, and I wish you could have seen it, was literally by all these individuals that are up here, those individuals, the people that we represent were sitting side by side. And then we couldn't even tell them to go home because they did not want to go home because they were doing the right thing for the community. Like I have often said, these are our communities and we will fight like heck to keep everyone safe. To support the Albuquerque Police Department's investigation, the FBI formed a task force of more than 100 investigators, intelligence analysts, and other experts from the following agencies. We had folks from FBI headquarters, a crisis management unit. We also had the men and women, the proud men and women of the Albuquerque Police Department, the U.S. Attorney's Office, ATF, U.S. Customs and Border Protection, New Mexico State Police, Bernalillo County District Attorney's Office, and Bernalillo County Sheriff's Office. The task force worked 24-7, <clears throat> and we're going to continue to work diligently. We've had a total of about 230 tips. Most of them have come through Crime Stoppers, and some have come through 1-800-CALL-FBI. And we're going to continue to take all those tips for this one reason, because there might still be evidence out there. Someone might still have seen something that will make sure that we're not missing anything as far as this investigation goes. I want to take this opportunity to thank all the men and women who worked so well as a team and spent so much time on this case. We worked as a team. We were friends to start with and were better friends afterwards. They personify what is meant by the relentless pursuit of justice. I want to especially thank Chief Medina for his leadership to our city in this difficult time, as well as the mayor and the governor. They weren't calling for updates. They were calling to see what else can we do. If the public has any additional tips, please continue to reach out to us. Our thoughts and prayers continue to be with the victims and their loved ones during this difficult time. Let us honor them as a community by coming together to make sure justice is done. It's our diversity and our unity that makes Albuquerque beautiful. Thank you. So the other federal partner we had was the ATF. I want to introduce Travis Riddle, who's the Assistant Special Agent in charge of the Phoenix Field Division. Good afternoon. Uh, first and foremost, uh, ATF would like to express our deepest condolences and sympathies to the victims and the families of this senseless tragedy. Our agents are members of this community, and we feel this loss also. We've used every available resource to support our partners in prosecuting those responsible. ATF has brought our unique capabilities to this investigation, such as our ability to trace firearms and process ballistic evidence. We've used these resources to help our law enforcement partners bring the individuals to justice. ATF contributes technical expertise to law enforcement efforts by providing the use of its NIBIN or the National Integrated Ballistics Information Network, FARMS technology. We utilize this in processing ballistic evidence to determine if a farm was used in one shooting and has also been used in additional shootings. We see patterns that were previously unknown to us, and those links are valuable investigative leads. ATF takes a preventative approach to violent crime by targeting and prosecuting the sources of crime guns. The key tool in this effort is eTrace which is a secure web-based law enforcement network run by ATF's National Tracing Center. This system assists the National Tracing Center and other law enforcement agencies during their comprehensive traces of recovered crime guns from manufacturer to the last legal purchase. <coughs> Investigators use this data to uncover patterns of firearms trafficking, identify illegal and straw firearms, and develop leads to recover firearms used in violent crimes. I'm extremely proud to be here with you and with our partners to highlight the positive work done by all the agencies standing here today. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have District Attorney Raul Torres, who will talk about his involvement in the case and what comes next with the prosecution. Um, I think at the outset, it's, it's appropriate to really acknowledge and congratulate the Albuquerque Police Department. You know, for the last several years, our community has struggled with public safety issues and crime issues, 
and the police department under the leadership of Mayor Keller and Chief Medina have worked diligently to improve the practices, the professionalism, the resources that they bring to bear. And I think today's um, resolution is a demonstration of that leadership and they deserve great credit for that. Uh, I also want to recognize that although we are here to announce this resolution, that it is really just the beginning of, of the journey towards securing justice. And my commitment to you is to work on behalf of your family um, and all the other victims of this crime so that we can secure justice. And that will not be done until we secure a conviction and, and successful prosecution. To that end, there is still a great deal of work that is left to be done. As we speak, uh, prosecutors from the Major Crimes Division of the District Attorney's Office, along with prosecutors assigned from the U.S. Attorney's Office, are reviewing warrant applications both for additional investigative leads um, as well as uh, reviewing proposed charges for the individual who's been identified today. But um, this is, is a complicated case, and I will reserve for a later time a full discussion of the types of charges that, that will um, take place over the next weeks and days. I can tell you that it is the intention of the District Attorney's Office in conjunction with the Albuquerque Police Department to file murder charges in state district court. Uh, we are also working with our federal partners on the possibility of uh, filing and pursuing federal charges at the same time if there is an appropriate federal statute. Um, one thing that I would also like to point out and, and to take a moment to recognize is the leadership of Special Agent in Charge Raul Buhanda who is uh, leading the FBI's local division. I have worked with and known a number of his predecessors, and he is doing extraordinary work. Um, you know, he referenced the, the first task force meeting where all of the agencies got together. And I can tell you as somebody who has been a prosecutor for most of the last couple of decades, when you get law enforcement together, they don't always cooperate. They don't always uh, get along. Sometimes there is a lot of discussion about who's in charge of what, and I can tell you from the very beginning that FBI, ATF, state police, and APD um, worked seamlessly and collaboratively. And that is a model for what we need to bring to bear for every violent crime in this community so that every voice matters and that every loss matters. And so on behalf of the District Attorney's Office, I want to <coughs> make that commitment to you. And I want to, again, thank the hard work of the men and women of law enforcement who made this resolution possible. Thank, thank you. you. And our final speaker will be Ahmad Assad, who's been a, a great champion of the Muslim community. And I know many of you have known him, have talked to him uh, about this whole, uh, this tough week we've had. Um, he's going to say some concluding words. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, Many of you know that I, I'm not a very uh, shy person and pretty, thought I was pretty strong uh, practicing law 28 years. Um, but I have to tell you that in hearing and being amongst these, um, uh, these wonderful people, these dedicated servants, uh, bravery that has been displayed has uh, brought me almost to tears. I have to tell you that, especially when, uh, uh, when I learned that statement came up that they did not want to go home. That was just resonated with me, and um, I'm just humbled on behalf of the entire community, and behalf and behalf of New Mexico. I am a New Mexican, first and foremost, and I am proud of the law enforcement um, uh, partners and all offices represented today for their steadfast commitment to our community and to bring in justice swiftly. Chief Medina promised me from the very beginning when he and I and D.A. Torres had our first meeting, he said, Ahmad, you tell your community, we're going to get them and not to worry, have confidence in us. We've never wavered, Chief Medina, and, um, and you've met your burden plus. We're humbled with everybody's commitment. I can't express enough the gratitude that I have from my community, from the bottom of my heart, on behalf of all the family members of, uh, of the ones we lost and we still mourn, we will not ever forget. Uh, and we're hopeful that we have no further losses in our community. 
We're also hopeful that violence at large um, is, is eliminated. And uh, we pray for every family, not just Muslim families, for the losses they've endured in the era of violence, if you will. So I'm a big fan of law enforcement today standing before you. I'm a big fan of every one of these folks all the way bottom up, top down from the chain, all the way up, all the way down. I am deeply humbled and I am thankful for everything they presented today. We hope and pray that, um, that things uh, are brought to a, a conclusion and there's some closure for the family soon. We respect, certainly, the, the criminal justice system and the presumption of innocence, and we understand that. Uh, D.A. Torres is right. This is just the beginning. There are a lot of complications and steps that need to go forward. But I don't want to take a lot of your time. I wanted to make an emphatic statement today about how thankful and immensely gra grateful we are for all the hard work. We're very proud of our New Mexicans. We're very proud of our law enforcement agents and from my representatives, from the governor's office all the way down, from our congressional delegate, uh, Congresswoman Melanie Stansbury, from the mayor, um, from DA Torres, from the FBI, from all the law enforcement partners. Everybody, I can name everybody that's here and not here that's working boots on the ground. Ahmad Assad, this community, New Mexico, appreciates everything you've done. Thank you. Uh, before we shift to questions, uh, Chief Medina, I just want to say a few words, and then we'll t happily take your questions. You know, one of the questions that I know is probably going to come up today and that we addressed uh, early on as an administration and everybody here was, were we going to label this a hate crime or were we going to label this a serial killer? And we stood strong and we held the line that we weren't going to name, uh, use any of those labels at that point in time because it would have been irresponsible for us as a police department to say that and further drive fear into a community that was already in fear. Uh, we still don't have any indication that either of these uh, incidents uh, or topics, labels would have been appropriate. And as the investigation continues, if it changes, uh, we will surely uh, notify the public and be transparent about that. Well, I know that was going to come up, and I wanted to thank our public information officer, Gilbert, because many of the times as I was out, <clears throat> it was Gilbert who was in front of the camera who stood strong and made sure that uh, we stayed uh, strong on our stance and that uh, we defended it. Thank you. So we'll take questions now. I'll do my best to farm them out to whoever can answer them, but don't feel free to jump in if you guys want to take a, one of these questions. So with that. Can we, learn, can we hear some more about the, the motive that's being examined by the authorities right now, whether this, I mean, the press release stated something about interpersonal conflict. And we've heard that the suspect's daughter may have married a Shia man. The suspect is Sunni Muslim. Can we hear more about that? Uh, Deputy Chief, Deputy Commander Hartsock can speak to that a little bit. And I will also mention that once we have charging documents and a criminal complaint, we'll release that as well, which will have some of the details. The motives are still being explored fully to understand what they are. We do have some information about those events taking place but we're not really clear if, if that was the actual motive, if it was part of a motive, if there's just a bigger picture that we're missing. So what's really important is we're still investigating it, even though he's arrested today. We're going to continue to investigate and work with our prosecutors to understand what the motives were, and that's important in every violent crime investigation we have. So we have heard those things, but we're not sure if that's the only motivation. Is it correct that the suspect is Sunni and the two of the, most, the three most recent victims were Shia? Uh, we've heard different versions of the sex. We're not too clear on it, so we can't be accurate right here in front of you today to confirm it. And what about the chase that took place all the way to Santa Rosa? Was that like a high-speed chase uh, that, that involved state police? How did that uh, unfold? It was not a high-speed chase. It was a traffic stop that occurred uh, off the I-40 exit in Santa Rosa with state police and Albuquerque Police Department and the FBI assisting. Was he being followed the entire time? We're not going to get into that, but we pulled him over in Santa Rosa and were able to stop him and detain him. Um, throughout this investigation, we've been saying killer and killers. Are there more suspects that you are looking into at this time? Right now, we're only charging one person, but evidence, we're going to follow the evidence. If the evidence leads us to someone else that needs charges, we'll be happy to file them with the DA's office. And when you went to the SWAT situation at the house, was there any resistance from the family uh, or were they cooperative in getting the evidence that you needed? 
As far as I know, we were able to safely remove everyone from the house. I don't know what level of cooperation we had, but we were able to remove everyone from the house and interviewed most of the occupants. Yeah. How strong is the evidence or how confident that this suspect is connected to the other two murders that are part of this case? It's strong enough that we're continuing, continuing to, to list him as the most likely uh, person of interest or suspect in the case. But again, if the evidence leads us to someone else, we're going to follow the evidence. Does the, uh, does the ballistic evidence show that a different firearm was used in the first killing and the, and the most recent killing? That analysis isn't done quite yet, so we don't know. Can you say anything more about the tip that you got? It, it was it was as a result of of the reaching out to the community we did um, it came from from the Muslim community uh, directly to APD and the FBI and we explored it but you'll see in the complaint a little more context to it but we're not going to detail it too much more but it pointed us in the direction of the Saeed family at least can you tell us any more about the background of the suspect where he's from when he came to the US uh, our information shows us he's from Afghanistan. Uh, we think he came in the last several years to the United States. Um, he does have a few minor uh, misdemeanor arrests from uh, domestic violence to some other misdemeanors by the Albuquerque Police Department over the past three or four years. That's our only known history with him locally. But again, that's still being explored in a, at a wider uh, view. Just a question for DA Torres. You, you mentioned the, the high bar for federal charges. Uh, would those federal charges include hate crime charges if it is indeed some sort of, um, you know, an episode like that? Sure. So I, I would defer to my colleague from the U.S. Attorney's Office to answer the specifics about the applicability of federal hate crimes charges. At this point, uh, from the perspective of state prosecution, we are we are not focused on that right now, but as Deputy Commander Hartsog alluded to, we are still um, finding out new information about the context, the motivation, the various individuals uh, who were involved in, in, the, in the story behind and the conflict maybe that, that led up to the recent incidents. But in terms of uh, f filing federal hate crimes charges, I would defer to Alex Ubias on that. Can you say more about the ambassador program you mentioned that laid the groundwork that you might have gotten this tip from the Muslim community? You know, uh, one of the things, uh, as we all know, the Albuquerque Police Department is under a settlement agreement. And one of the parts of that settlement agreement with the federal government is the fact that we had to increase and improve our relationships with the community. So what we did is we created a group of officers and we trained them in dealing with individuals from that were in minority status. And sometimes it's, it's based off of race, religion, uh, and uh, we assign officers to these groups of individuals, and these officers are the ears. Uh, I call them the ears from the Albuquerque Police Department for the voices never heard. And it's a concept that will continue. And I think that during this time, we recognized that there were two things that we needed to accomplish as a police department. First is we had to have a good, strong investigation. But on the other hand, we needed to make sure that we were working and ensuring that the community felt safe. I want to thank our Deputy Chief of the Field, uh, Josh Brown. He was very active in making sure that uh, field officers, our problem response teams, were out and they were contacting the community and that we had an open door of communication and that we had officers stationed at different places to make individuals feel safe. So our ambassador program will continue to be the flagship of the Albuquerque Police Department reaching out and working with all segments of the community and ensuring that we're always listening to everybody. Uh, he did make a statement. Uh, the suspect who's being charged, uh, his sons were questioned as well, but released. And they've both been released? Yes. What kind of digital forensic evidence are you looking into to connect everyone? And um, was the online portal helpful with these tips? You mentioned technology and investment in that. Uh, we're definitely on, on every violent crime investigation. We're always looking at any kind of digital evidence. Uh, we can't comment too much on that right now. Um, and the online portal was extremely helpful as well as Crime Stoppers tips. We had several people upload video surveillance from their homes in the areas uh, voluntarily to us uh, that captured 
you know, the sounds of the shots, vehicles leaving, other cars in the area, these things were very helpful and they were a direct result of that reach out to the public and them submitting tips. And the technology allows people to now just upload videos, right? We don't even have to go out anymore. They can just upload them directly to us. So that's, that's pretty amazing. Nothing that we can confirm right now, but on the same as Thursday, we're going to look at any crimes that we think could be related to this, whether it's by ballistics, witnesses, any other evidence. Again, we're going to keep a very open mind, even though he's charged with two murders today. We're very open minded that if we find evidence of any other crimes, we're going to absolutely pursue that uh, all the way to the end. Can you tell us more about the suspect's residence where, where uh, it was searched? Uh, was it a rental? Was it an apartment, a home? How many people lived there? Uh, just his family lived there. I'm unsure on the rental ownership status. Was it an apartment or a home? You know, I don't know if it was an apartment or a home, was to be he honest. there when you did the search at the time? No, he was not. He was in the car uh, near Santa Rosa. We pulled him over first, and then the SWAT team uh, executed the search warrant at the house. What is the current status of the suspect? Has he, has he been booked? No, we're working on getting the warrant uh, completed with the DA's office, but he is detained uh, inside this building right now. Can we confirm a date of birth for Mr. Saeed? We can, just not right this second, but just give us a minute. Can you say more about his domestic violence charges? I don't know too much about them. I know all three were dismissed. And then you did uh, get the murder weapon? We believe we have two weapons that we believe uh, were used in one or both of the killings on Rhode Island and Cornell. Yes. You mentioned there was a firearm in the vehicle when you executed the traffic stop. Did officers know that firearm was in the vehicle? Not until they affected the traffic stop and, and saw it as they approached the car. Do you believe he was heading out of state for Texas? We're still investigating that. Yeah, we're, we're unsure of what the purpose of the travel was, and that's still under investigation. So just to confirm, he was cooperative when he was taken into arrest? I don't know all the details, but he was detained at that point and brought back to Albuquerque for his interview. Was he pulling out when uh, detectives and the FBI showed up, or was he already gone? We can't comment on all the specifics on that, but at the time we pulled him over in Santa Rosa, he pulled over for us. We then executed the search warrant uh, just after he was detained. Um, what would tie the suspect to the first killings back in November of last year? Right now the MO was what matches and we have found there's a possible personal relationship between <coughs> the victim and him, but still very early on and unclear. Can you say that there was a possible relationship? Are you talking about all of the victims or just a couple, a few? Honestly, we're still investigating to try to really understand all the relationships. But again, the community and the families have been very helpful in this. Um, that's the thing I'll say, too, is the FBI's Victim Assistance Program, as well as our Victim Services Unit, have been working together and working with four different families that are in Albuquerque and across oceans to uh, communicate with the families, learn background information, and in some cases help handle how the remains are going to be shipped back overseas. So. We're working with our advocates and the families, and it's helping us understand and be educated on a lot of this background. Uh, now that someone has been detained, the two mobile units that APD has set up at uh, Luna Linda Park and at Highland High School, will those still be in intact, or will those be taken down? You know, we're going to continue to have a presence in the community, as uh, we stated earlier, and at least to, through the end of the week, there will be those visible presence and those uh, units, those mobile units will remain on scene. One of the other things I want to mention is like, uh, Secretary Bowie, I just want to thank you with, uh, and State Police. Uh, our air support unit was down, and on Sunday when we made the announcement uh, that uh, ab about the suspect vehicle, uh, State Police immediately had up their air support unit because we did have a fear that the individual would try to leave, and uh, we were looking for all exit points of the city to see if the car went. So just everybody once again working together was a, a big success for us, and you know we did try to plan for this individual leaving. He didn't leave that night, but it looks like the next day uh, individuals drove out of the city. So I'll see.
You have been watching the very latest from Albuquerque police investigators sharing they have a suspect in custody connected to the murders of four Muslim men in the city. That suspect is 51 year old Mohammed Saeed. Police officially charging Saeed with two of these killings, sharing they searched his car and his home, finding a gun matching bullet cases at the scene. Investigators believe Saeed is also tied to two other shootings, but are still collecting evidence before deciding on additional charges. We continue now with Action 7 News at 4. Now, looking at the timelines for these murders, it starts back in November of last year when Mohammed Ahmadi was shot outside a store he owned. This year, on July 26, Aftab Hussein was shot near his home. Several days later, Mohammed Afsal Hussein was also shot near his home. And most recently, Naeem Hussein was shot Friday night outside an organization that serves refugees and asylum seekers. Now, all of this brings us to today that suspected car located. 51 year old Mohammed Mohammed Saeed taken into custody. Right now, Saeed charged with the July murder of Aftab Hussein and the August 1st murder of Mohammed Afsal Hussein. Throughout this, safety for the Muslim community has been a priority. The head of the Islamic Center of New Mexico telling ABC News one way they are working to make sure the community feels safer is by expanding their meal program. They're now able to feed students at UNM, which they say is one of their most vulnerable groups. UNM also has houses many of our students that are a very vulnerable part of the community at this point you know they have no means to travel they generally travel on foot from their dorms or from apartments that live close so we're working hand in hand with the city of albuquerque as well they've offered meals as well he also says they're encouraging everyone to only travel in groups and not go out at night and if you see anything unusual to call police University now also working to try and keep students safe. They hosted a seminar for more than 700 students and teachers yesterday about their partnership with APD and New Mexico State Police. They say they're working to set up a 311 system to help students get access to trauma counseling and help with groceries or hot meals. We are aware that this is a frightening and disheartening situation, and this leaves everyone in our UNM community feeling insecure. UNM says they are working with students, advisors, and faculty to change the times or types of late night in person courses for the duration of the emergency. Police urging students to be smart about their safety by being aware of your surroundings and not walking around looking at your cell phone or with your headphones in. The family of the fourth victim, Naeem Hussein, who was killed just last Friday, speaking to KOAT reporter Stephanie Muniz. Hussein's family sharing that he loved Albuquerque, staying here even after his family wanted him to move closer to home. But uh, he's like, no, it's it's really beautiful. But he was, you know, planning to slowly transition into Virginia, but uh, uh, didn't happen. But as far as Albuquerque, he he loved the lifestyle there. He loved how it was lay, more laid back and um, the topography as well. Yeah. We will continue to hear from Hussein's family throughout all of our newscasts tonight. And once again. These are the four men who were murdered. The person believed to be behind their murders now in custody, officially charged right now only with two of their murders. The Islamic Center says they are having a memorial for those victims. We will have more on that throughout tonight's newscast. And of